everybody at home. This is Nitin from Flashpoint History. I've uh, got with me uh, Craig from the Pacific. Uh, how do you want me to uh, like introduce you? <laughs> oh, you just say Craig from the Pacific War Channel. Sure. Okay. Craig from the Pacific War Channel. And uh, we're here to talk about the Doolittle Raid today. Uh, we're going to try a kind of a new format, uh, just kind of a back and forth to talk about this incredible time. And... Um, all right, let's just go ahead and get started. So it's 1941, the World War II, uh, at least in the European uh, theater of operations is well underway. Pan is kind of at a crossroads. Uh, it is deeply involved in the, the mainland, uh, parts of China, it has overrun parts of Korea. But the problem is, is that in order to continue with their operations, they, they need desperately uh, material, oil, iron, you name it. And uh, a lot of this stuff, it's being imported from other countries, especially the United States, where I've seen estimates as high as 70 percent. It could be higher that they're they're importing oil. And this is something that that is just not sustainable. Uh, the United States gets wind of, you know, what Japan is doing. It's not liking it. And suddenly embargoes start coming in. And this is to Japan, basically a knife through its throat. Uh, if it no longer has oil, it's no longer able to continue with its oil operations or its uh, military operations. And in that situation, it has to have some sort of reprisal. Uh, what they need to do is they need to expand in order to take out as many resources as they possibly can. And a lot of this will involve taking over areas like the Philippines, um, areas of Southeast Asia, which are heavy in resources. But these areas are either controlled by um, the United States or by uh, other foreign powers, uh, specifically the United Kingdom. So in order to do that, it needs to do a sneak attack. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to see if I can find that uh, clip that you sent me with uh, FDR going on his, his uh, speech. And so, you know, he basically states December 7th, 1941, a date that shall live in infamy. December 7th, 1941 was the day that America woke up to the harsh new reality that war could no longer be avoided. And he responds with the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by the Naval Air Forces, of the Empire of Japan. That day, a Japanese task force unleashed a surprise attack on the American military installation on the island of Oahu in Hawaii. And then his response was, it will be recorded that the uh, distance of Hawaii from Japan makes it obvious that the attack was deliberately planned, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, my response to that would be, this was the end result of strained diplomatic tensions between the two nations that had finally breached the breaking point. Uh, FDR's response, the attack yesterday on the Hawaiian Islands was, has caused severe damage. Lives have been lost. And the Japanese attack, with the exception of the American carriers, had put the Pacific fleet essentially out of action. The United States started the war losing, enraged, and already on the defensive. FDR knew that the only thing that would be worse would be to lose morale. He surmised what he wanted, and he would say, no matter how long it may have, uh, no matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people and their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. And therefore, he asked the Congress that he wants to establish a state of war. So this episode of the Air War will be about the Doolittle Raid and how a small military raid can have a dramatic effect on morale. At the beginning of the 20th century, Japan had emerged as a power to be reckoned with. It had undergone rapid industrialization during what was known as the Mijai Restoration and was able to hold on against the West on various different fronts. And, and the, uh, the Russians were soundly defeated at the naval battle of Tsushima, which came as a shock to the Western world, which saw East Asia as merely a place to be exploited in one person's sphere of influence or another. From that point onwards, Japan's ambition had grown. It became their doctrine that if they were to compete as a world power, they would have to expand in order to secure resources, food, labor, etc., for, for that, that prestige. By the 1930s, the Empire of Japan had heavily invested its forces in East Asia. 
Hey everyone, I just wanted to let you know I now have a Patreon account found at www.patreon.com slash the Pacific War channel. Over there you can find exclusive Patreon episodes and podcasts based on suggestions from patrons, and other benefits like early access to all of my content, live hangouts, your name in the end credits, and much, much more. So please go check it out. With a large contingents operating in Korea, Southeast Asia, and China, Imperial forces would bring untold suffering to those that had conquered, inflicting massacres of the civilian populations. Eventually, this would strain relations with other powers, namely the United States. As far back as 1918, the Imperial Defensive Policy designated America as enemy number one. But ironically, it was the United States that the Japanese relied on for raw material and, and its fuel. This reliance they saw as a vulnerability and as a humiliation. When the Japanese policy changed to institute trade restrictions on these resources, Japanese militarists saw this as a threat to their nation's well-being. Then, in the summer of 1941, the United States placed an embargo on the most valuable resource, oil. Japan now stood at a crossroads, either relinquish its military ambitions for an empire, which was unpalatable for its ruling party, or attain the resources it needed by further conquest in Southeast Asia and the Indo-Australian archipelago. This would mean taking Malaysia, the Dutch East Indies, the Philippines, and a host of islands to secure their perimeter, well, which meant war not just against European powers that held onto those islands, but also, and more importantly, war with the United States. Okay. Uh, if you want to talk a little bit about uh, Japanese preparation for the attack. Yeah, so Japan was going to unleash the Nanshinran strategy. They had debated within the Joint Chiefs of St Staff of their military what was the best options going forward because of the resource issue. Originally, the IGA thought that they were going to go with Hoko Shinran, which was to attack the USSR, but that was deemed insanity. And there was no proof of concept because they couldn't prove they would find the resources they need uh, in Siberia. So they were going to have to seize, like you said, any places in the Southeast uh, Indies. So the Dutch East Indies was the place where they would get rubber and oil, the most uh, specific resources that they needed. In order to get that, they were going to have to go to war absolutely with Britain and with the United States simply because of the Philippines being there. So the Philippines was to be attacked simultaneously. It actually gets hit at the exact same moment as Pearl Harbor. The attack on Pearl Harbor, as outlined by Yamamoto, had to achieve absolute secret, uh, a surprise element to it, or else it wouldn't work. The whole idea of the operation in Yamamoto's mind was to give the Japanese Pacific fleet enough time to seize all the territories it needed to secure the resources for a prolonged war, and he estimated if they could knock out the United States Pacific Fleet, they'd have about six months at minimum, if not a full year. But he couldn't promise any other operations after that. And Yamamoto himself was not a big proponent for attacking the United States in the first place. I mean, he was commander in chief of the Imperial Japanese Combined Fleet during the Second World War, but he had also spent considerable time in the United States, correct? Yeah, so he got to study in the United States, and he did something most high-ranking Japanese officers never got to do. He got to visit factories. That was a crucial component to his mentality. He got to see a Ford factory, for example, and how they produce anything you can imagine. And in Japan, the way that production works was completely different. And for lack of better words, it wasn't very modern. Japan could create great armaments, much similar to Germany and their model, but they didn't have assembly lines for these things. They couldn't build them en masse and they could not build them fast. So he knew that uh, at any given point if the United States were to turn on the switch, production would have overwhelmed Japan. Yeah, he, he, I think one of his statements was that he was not necessarily confrontational, but he was maybe perhaps talking to one of his aides and he's like, you know, you, you haven't seen the industrial output of Detroit. Yes. Uh, you haven't seen the naval yards of the East Coast. You haven't seen the oil fields of Texas. You, you don't know what we're dealing with. And ironically, his rival, Hideki Tojo, who also went to the United States, spent his whole time sitting on a train. And he went across the country. He never took the time to actually do anything in America. He was extremely ignorant. And he, most of the Japanese were fairly ignorant of the production capabilities of Japan. 
uh, someone like Adolf Hitler as well. Hitler was very ignorant to the production capabilities of the United States. They both Hitler and many high ranking members of the Japanese army and Navy assumed the Americans were isolationists, wouldn't go out of their way unless there was money involved. They kind of had this vision of, I guess you would call it the fat cats, that the United States would never accost itself to go to war unless it could get something out of it, which is a I, big reason they went to war. Yeah, I think one of the reasons why Hitler actually declared war on the United States after Pearl Harbor, uh, he actually, and I read this somewhere, I'm not sure where, but he said to one of his aides, like, oh, the Americans, they're not going to have any military impact until like 1976 is what he thought. Uh, but um, obviously he was way off the mark. He was actually basing that off World War One, the things that he had seen, because, you know, the Americans came in at the very end of it. And even uh, with the presence of American forces at the, the beginning of World War One, they didn't make uh, an enormous contribution right away because the Germans had mounted a giant counteroffensive in World War One. But the very last year of World War One, of course, the Americans completely trampled over them. But uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Hitler was very ignorant of uh, the capabilities of other countries. But that was also because Germany and Japan suffered a unique problem with production. Uh, they had this kind of craftsmanship where if you take a German tank, for example, most German engineers built start to finish the same tank. They didn't diversify specialization so that there was assembly lines of people who built the, the tire tracks, this part, that part, this part. Until late into World War II, they never actually achieved that. Japan... Uh, there was people building parts of the airplanes in their backyards, talking about people in their own homes. It's, uh, <laughs> it's incredible like how they created the Zero Fighter for as long as they did, but uh, it certainly wasn't uh, productive. But for Operation to hit Pearl Harbor, a lot of things needed to be done. One of the key concepts was to use aircraft carriers. And uh, for those listening in the audience, you have to understand not only was the general public not really aware or understood the future of what the carrier would play in the war, almost every single admiral, even including Yamamoto himself to some extent, still believed in an old school policy of we, we call it the big gun policy. It's that battleships would wage a decisive war against other battleships. And that's how a Navy actually fights. And that carriers was more or less kind of a supportive thing on the side. It wasn't the main piece on the board. And a lot, of these, a lot of these admirals even thought it was kind of ridiculous that every time that a carrier uh, task force uh, had to divert away uh, to go into the wind in order to launch its uh, planes, they thought this was like ridiculous. It was like some sort of like child's play kind of a thing. Oh, look at the fleet going off to their thing, you know? Um, so yeah, I agree. I, I think that the... The reality that aircraft carriers were going to be the mainline ship was still just not appreciated at its time. Not at all. And everybody got a taste of it just before Pearl Harbor. There was a single engagement called the Battle of Taranto, where the British attacked uh, the Italian naval fleet at anchor. And they were using ferry swordfish, which for anyone listening, picture World War One biplanes attacking a World War II modern and very powerful fleet. The Italians had a very strong navy. And yet the effect was overwhelming. And and I think Yamamoto was basically taking notes on this thing and he kind of figured, well, if the British can do this with a single aircraft carrier with World War I biplanes in shallow if, water. In shallow water, then, then what if we like crank up the notch like 15 degrees and instead of sending one aircraft carrier, we send, well, all of them. And Yamamoto's uh, chief intel, uh, chief guy under him at the time, who was going to be the mastermind behind some of the engineering aspects of Pearl Harbor, he had to figure out how to get torpedoes to um, go through the shallow water. They used uh, wooden fins for theirs. The British had actually done something a little sillier using uh, wires and string to make sure that it hit the water at such an angle it wouldn't go too deep for their Toronto mm -hmm. mission. Um, a lot of people think, uh, learning the Battle of Toronto, that it's X and then it creates like that's patient zero and that creates what happens at Pearl Harbor. It turns out that Yamamoto had already been creating his plan prior to that about two months or so before. And the tail fin idea for the torpedoes was basically done by this point. But the battle of Toronto, when he presented it to everybody who told him Pearl Harbor was insane, because he was pitching this like a businessman would, they had to acknowledge, yes, it did work. 
because the Battle of Toronto was devastating. They crushed half the Italian fleet that couldn't set sail for months. You can't argue with success. That's the problem. <laughs> and uh, Yamamoto, as he does multiple times in his career, uh, he threatened to resign if they wouldn't go ahead with the Pearl Harbor idea. He does it quite a few times in the war. <laughs> so. so then on November of 1941, in um, the task force under the commander, vice admiral, it, now the pronunciation always gets me. I've heard Nagumo and then I've heard Nagumo. Both are correct. It depends if, um, to give an example, when the Japanese pronounce uh, their names as Anglophone, as people who speak English, we say things differently. So the name um, Tomi Tomoyuki Yamashita, most English people would say Yamashita. And it's, it's proper to say it like this. For Nagumo, you can say Nagumo. Yeah, I, I was always brought up with Nagumo. It, it just seemed right. And then all of a sudden, everybody was saying it differently. And, and as I've said numerous times before, pronunciation is not my forte. I have many faults, and <laughs> that's one of them. Uh, so in, in November, the uh, task force um, under Nagumo sets out. And uh, this was a force consisting of six aircraft carriers, two battleships, two heavy cruisers, a light cruiser, nine destroyers, three submarines, and eight tankers. Uh, each of them left off of uh, Tank and Bay, and uh, they headed out. Yeah, so it's known as the Kido Butai, the greatest pilots in the world, probably at that point in history. The veterans who perform this operation go on to almost without a break to fight for about a year during the Pacific War. And uh, they gave the edge to the Japanese once the Japanese actually lose their veterans or their veterans are shuffled around and who don't end up training the new generations of pilots for some reason. That's a very odd thing that happens to Japan. Uh, Japan is greatly diminished. But this force under strict radio silence, which despite certain conspiracy theories that persist to this day, was abided by. They actually locked the radios down, as they say, was traveling across the North Pacific to hit Pearl Harbor from the north. And they were uh, they did a ton of deceptive maneuvers to make sure that the Americans had no idea what was going on. Uh, for example, the Japanese were well aware um, of the American intelligence networks that were watching their troop their ship movements, and they made sure to do a rotation for months and months and months that looked normal so that the carriers could simply escape, which looked like a routine operation to the Americans. They had no idea. And yeah, they, um, they, yeah. they took pathways that were off the regular shipping routes and um, they, they picked places because to some extent they knew kind of where the U.S. Navy's, um, the, the PBY patrol planes were going to be checking yeah. out. And so they kind of made it a point to stay away from that. Mm -hmm. And they were also at the same time, they had a man, I guess you could call him like a James Bond like figure was on the grounds in Hawaii, Takeo Yoshikawa who was feeding them all the information daily about what ships were at port, where to expect ships, especially where the battleships were, because despite what people may think, uh, it's sometimes funny to hear, but the main target was the battleships. Yamamoto right. would lament later that the carriers were not hit, but the main target had always been the battleships at Battleship Row. So this spy was feeding all the information up until the day before, that was his last transmission, and he was working with uh, some German spies as well. And the German spies, not to get too much down the rabbit hole, were actually terrible at their job and they got caught, which is kind of funny. <laughs> but uh, the well, speaking, oh. speaking of conspiracy theory and then the aircraft carriers that were supposedly not there, I, I've heard the conspiracy theory is that FDR actually <laughs> knew about this attack. And he wanted to be in the war so badly, but he was going up against such a strong American stiff headwind of isolationism yeah. that he uh, purposely left the battleships there, including the the Utah, which was kind of a, an old uh, battleship. Oh, an ex-battleship at that point. Ex-battleship. Yeah. And, um, and then he secretly sailed off the aircraft carriers and uh, kept them out of harm's way just in the nick of time, right? Um, what, what do you think about that? Uh, for it's it's funny because it, that is definitely the number one conspiracy theory when it comes to Pearl Harbor. Um, aircraft carriers perform routine operations, and they were as much as people would hate to hear it. They were just on a routine operation. Actually, they were moving <laughs> planes somewhere, so that's all that was going on. And uh, it's it's very fortunate for the United States because yeah, if those aircraft carriers were hit, um, they were one of the first things that were used during the Pacific War, and they devastated the Marshals and the Gilberts at the offset of the war. So they were de desperately needed. And there was only four aircraft carriers in the Pacific at the beginning. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. This is why I'm I'm really glad I'm having you on for this show because I mean you, your insight on this is just it's spot on. So the attack on Pearl Harbor happens uh, on the morning of December seventh, nineteen forty one. Admiral Nagumo launches the first of what was intent initially meant to be three attack waves. Um, yes. Only two of them kind of go in. Um, air bases throughout the island of Oahu are neutralized, making way for the torpedo and dive bombers to hit the ships. So this I will is, just this... uh, add to that because sure. uh, it's just a small piece of the the puzzle that no one ever talks about. Uh, the first attack on Pearl Harbor was actually uh, via midget submarines. Uh, there were five oh. of them. They tried to sneak into the harbor. Uh, some there is talks that one of them managed to get a torpedo off on one of the ships in question, but more or less they all met hor horrible, horrible fates, and they sunk. And uh, I think the last one was found in two thousand and three. So uh, the midget submarines um, were a horrible idea. Uh, I think actually Yamamoto hated the idea that they were attached to the operation. Uh, the USS Ward, which was a kind of a patrol ship that was out near the harbor was warned of a periscope that they saw. They went, they depth charged what was an enemy submarine before the attack on Pearl Harbor commenced. And they sent word of this through the chain of command and it just got joggled up. But the chain of command at Pearl Harbor was warned of enemy presence. So it's kind of just fate as it were. So the waves come in and they hit uh, the airfields that you had mentioned. It's Hickam Field, Wheeler Field, and then later it's Bellows Field in the second wave. But just so people understand, when you are attacking uh, something like Pearl Harbor, the first thing that you want to attack is whatever can be thrown back at you. So all of the aircraft on the island were the primary targets right away, just to get rid of them. And get rid of them, they did. The uh, The Japanese absolutely destroyed those fields. And the Americans ships. actually made it easier for the Japanese to do yeah. this. Their biggest concern was sabotage. And so their plan was to line up all the planes, kind of wingtip to wingtip, to make it easier to spot them and, you know, scan them. But that made the strafing just so much easier. Actually, it's uh, identical to what happens in the Philippines with uh, General Douglas MacArthur's situation. Caught on the ground. Well, some of them were in the air, but a lot of them are caught on the ground, completely destroyed. Uh, before the ships are then hit by the torpedo bombers, which um, is unbelievable when you see some of the footage. To this very day, I happen to know an individual who uncovered brand new footage of the largest explosion at Pearl Harbor, which was the USS Arizona. Literally came out of the water when it blew up. Right. And it killed the, um, it killed about almost 2,000 people. Well, sorry, no, it was a thousand, like almost 1,300 people died on that alone. It's a, a huge tragedy. Yeah. And, and um, so then the, the, the attack waves go in, the torpedo bombers are, are able to hit their targets. The, uh, the straight level bombers are able to kind of inflict in. And then, as you had mentioned, the Arizona gets hit in its Ford magazine, which ignites it. And the thing just explodes in this massive uh, rupture. It yeah. breaks the ship almost in two. I've actually been to Pearl Harbor and I've seen the, um, the memorial and it's, mm -hmm. it's inspiring. If you look down into the water, you can still see that there's oil that's coming out of the wreckage of that ship. It's, uh, it's, it's insane. Uh, the attack continues. Uh, the air bases, as you've mentioned, are neutralized. The overall attack lasts for one hour and 45 minutes. And the Japanese achieve uh, complete success here. Uh, for the loss of just a handful of ships, uh, the uh, the fleet is basically rendered neutral for the time being. Uh, 200 planes destroyed with another 160 damaged is the, the total that I got. 19 ships altogether were hit, of which four battleships were either sunk. Another four were severely damaged. And I want to give a shout out to the Nevada, because this is something that I just um, learned about. Nevada was the only battleship was, that was actually able to get underway, correct? Yeah, tried to get out. Um, and yeah. as it was making its way to the mouth of the harbor, so the way you have to think about the Pearl Harbor is that there's all these different little bays that all lead to this one mouth. And as it's making its way to that mouth of, the, of Pearl Harbor, uh, the Japanese decide like, hey man, this would be a really great opportunity to take out. Yeah. And um, the, the captain of the ship decides instead of that happening, he intentionally beaches the ship uh, so that in shallow water, uh, so with the hopes that it can be repaired, refitted, and then hopefully sent into battle. Uh, 
because if if he had sunk in front of the of the entry to Pearl Harbor, that would have been the cherry on top of the Sunday because uh, oh god they wouldn't be able to move it. Their the United States presence in the Pacific would have been instead of six Done. months, you're looking at a year. It would have been hor- horrible. Uh, yeah, there there's a, a book I read. A what if scenario that says, what if instead of Admiral Nagumo in charge of this task force, it had been Yamamoto that was there. Uh, And basically what he would have done was he would have sent in the third wave. He would have sent in his uh, battleships to basically just destroy the island and and, and wreck Hawaii. It's actually kind of a fascinating read. I, I got a question for you, Craig. So what if, if it wasn't Nagumo, what if it was Yamamoto? And he had one of the battleships that was there. And correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, uh, there was the Congo. Uh, this thing was massive. Yeah, that and could launch 16 inch shells. Like that was a huge ship. <laughs> so I said, what if uh, y- Yamamoto had ordered the Congo to sail right into the harbor of, of Pearl Harbor and then ordered his men to scuttle the ship right in the middle of that harbor? Oh, wow. I've actually, I've never heard anyone bring that up. That would have been a fantastic idea. And that had, you know, in World War that, One, that's, that's, that's happened. just crazy enough for Yamamoto to come up with, you know, that that's what I was thinking. Yamamoto. I, 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 yes. Yeah, Yamamoto. He, if, if he was in charge of that fleet, like, like I said, I, I read this book that that was kind of a what if scenario that he was in charge, he would have just destroyed uh, Pearl Harbor. But what if if he had ordered the Congo to actually sail into the harbor of of that uh, area and then just scuttle it. I mean, you're talking about 180 ships that couldn't get out at that point. Yep. And unfortunately, the man that they send, uh, Trichi Nagumo, he was, the best way to describe this man is he was a by-the-books officer. You gave him orders, as dumb or smart as they were, he followed them no matter what. And he did not <laughs> like Yamamoto. Uh, he did not like serving under Yamamoto. He thought uh, Pearl Harbor was stupid. He also later in life thought the Midway operation was a, a very stupid idea. He didn't want to do it. But again, he was given charge to it because he was the most successful officer at the time because it was just endless victories under his belt. And when he came to the decision of whether to do a third wave or not, he made the right decision to leave. Yeah, he uh, he withheld the third attack because he felt that the element of surprise had been lost. Because the two carriers, well, there could have been three carriers for all the Japanese knew at this time. There could have been. They did not know where they were, and he thought that he was risking his force because they could attack them at any moment since they had lost the element of surprise. Ironically, if he had stayed and done a third wave, those two carriers probably would have come into the combat and been annihilated which would have played into their hand, not to mention the fact that the repair facilities and the oil tanks and all that other stuff, which all was their main target, all of that stuff would have been destroyed. And that plays a huge part yeah. because later in the war, those repair facilities made Pearl Harbor a viable base instead of having to ship everything back to the uh, West Coast of the United States for repair. Yes. So yeah, there's that. Because all were, those ships that were hit was in shallow water and they were repaired in incredible time because so what if they were hit so what if they sunk a bit they weren't capsized at the bottom of the ocean or anything a lot of them were it was quite easy to uh, fix them up and in a few months they were all operational well the ones that were so going back to the nevada for a second i I just realized this because i've been doing some work on uh d-day i uh, i plan on uh, hiking d-day from um in september from cherbourg to Khan, and um the nevada actually was brought back into service it uh, would sail down and then it would serve in the Atlantic. And uh, on D-Day, it was actually there shelling the beaches. Uh, It actually went on to shell Cherbourg. Uh, So it's kind of an amazing recovery for a ship that uh, was at the the bottom of the bay at one point. Battleships that are destroyed, severely damaged. It's estimated that over 2,400 men were killed. And the damage was so extensive that I heard it was pretty much covered up. Uh, yeah. The Japanese, on the other hand, lost 29 planes, five midget subs, and the IJN now decisively held the initiative as what they were going to do next. They held the entire Pacific Ocean. I mean, technically, the British had some Prince of Wales and stuff out there, but uh, there's no one really to contest them. The only real big players in the Pacific were the Netherlands, the British, and the Americans, and the few forces that they had let's say for america for the asiatic fleet that's closer to the philippines was 
insignificant, uh, couldn't do anything. Let's talk about this expansion that Japan did, because this is probably one of the largest and most rapid expansions in history. Grand, a lot of it was over water, but still, uh, the Japanese exploded at this point. Dan Carlin calls it a supernova in the East. I always like that. It, I, I like that too. That's um, his. Uh, for those in the audience that are not familiar with Dan Carlin, the guy is uh, one of the reasons why I actually got into podcasting in the first place. I can probably say that a lot of people feel the same way. He's very, very passionate about what he does. He has a multi-part series on uh, the Japanese uh, expansion in the Pacific, and it is just absolutely fabulous. If you get a chance, check it out. I can assert to it because I listen to it too. It's very good. I've 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 listened to everything he's ever put out. I think my personal favorite is still that World War One series that he did a long time ago. Oh yeah, uh, Blueprints for the Apocalypse. Yeah. How, how does it go? It's uh, Blueprints, yeah, Blueprints for, for the Armageddon. Blueprints for Armageddon. Armageddon. Blueprints for Armageddon. Yeah. But the, uh, the, the one. Well, let's we're digressing. <laughs> we're getting up the. I'm trying my best here. not to too. <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's um, in either case, Japanese expansion was extremely rapid. It was one of the uh, largest in history. So um, because I'm, I'm sure most of your audience is American, it's, it's actually hard for Americans to think about this, but you have to take even time zones into account. The Philippines is being hit simultaneously. Thailand, Malaya are hit, are hit simultaneously as Pearl Harbor is hit. Everything is being hit. Uh, one of my favorite generals of the, the Japanese during this war, uh, the Tiger of Malaya, General Tomoyuki Yamashita, he's the one that actually uh, performs the Malayan campaign and later will take Singapore. And he is a very unique general in the Japanese army because he was, like most, he went to Germany to learn uh, from their military. And he was very fascinated with Blitzkrieg. He got to see it firsthand and he took it to the battlefield in Malaya. He incorporated uh, the smaller tanks because the Japanese had terrible tanks, mind you. But he also uh, was a big proponent of bicycles. So he had all of his men find out how many bicycles were in Malaya. The Japanese got into Malaya and stole all the bicycles from the locals that they could. And they used it to outrace the British all the way to Singapore. And it sounds ridiculous, it does. but in reality, it the movement speed is life. And yeah. even having bicycles, um, if you can get even two people on the same bicycle, suddenly you have a very mobile army. <laughs> it, yeah. it makes a vast difference. The British and Indian forces that uh, were trying to build what you would call roadblocks or defensible positions all across Malaya, going from north to south couldn't do a thing because every time they got into a new position, they're already being attacked every single time. And the psychological effect was every time that they heard these thousands of guys riding bicycles, they thought tanks were coming because there were tanks involved in motorized vehicles, terrified them. They basically ran all the way to Singapore in the end. And they were being attacked by a force that was numerically smaller than them. And at Singapore, you have one of the greatest defeats in British history. It, and it's absolutely incredible. I know people will be screaming at me if I go into this myth, but they like to call it the bluff of Yamashita because he had a basically hit one third the amount of men. He was completely low on ammunition, low on fuel, didn't have necessarily enough uh, artillery shells to actually finish the job because this was a siege basically to attack Singapore. And what he does is he just starts sending messages over saying, surrender, it's inevitable, I'm going to take you out because he has to take them out now or else it's going to get botched down for a very long time. And he had a time schedule. And well, the <laughs> element of surprise works really well. And, of course. and and also, you know, having cojones like that to be able to go in there and just Ooh. say, hey, you just need to surrender, That, that that's it. <laughs> And the, the British buy it. It's it's um, they just basically lay down all of Singapore. And I've also heard that with Singapore, the British mentality was that they were always expecting an attack from the sea. Yes. And so most of the armament and guns and placements and stuff like that were geared towards that. To have attack come from the land was something completely bizarre. It took him also by surprise. I won't go too much into it, but there's actually a huge myth about this. So what you were talking about is the Gibraltar of the East, as they called it, Singapore, was a fortress. Correct. And they Correct. had these enormous naval guns. So these are shore batteries that are on top of the fortress that are aimed out at the sea because they're to attack ships that would bombard them. 
they could spin 180. So the myth has always been, oh, they had oh. these guns that couldn't turn around to shoot land forces. Wow, no, they okay. they could that's turn around. That's good to know. That's good to know. But using naval guns to attack incoming land forces? That's it. How? So armor-piercing rounds are used to shoot battleships. Armor-piercing rounds, when they're fired at land, they go straight into the dirt and explode, not doing anything to men who are standing upon the dirt. So when Yamashita took his forces from the north attacking Singapore, they were useless. They were lobbing shells that are like the size of vans <laughs> at them. But <laughs> these shells, uh, which did kill some people, mind you, because yes, they are going to, if they hit you, you're, you're going to die. They were very ineffective. And you're what you're going to vaporize if that thing hits you. I mean, they, yeah. <laughs> they're not, there's not going to be a body to find. And uh, Yamashita brilliantly put aside a bunch of small boats uh, hidden in some foliage while he put all of his artillery in one place, made it seem like he had all the shells in the world because he just unleashed his entire artillery in a matter of days, just shot as much as he could as a diversion, wasting almost all of his ammunition. And then he stormed into Singapore and eventually Percival, who was in charge, he surrendered. He came to the peace table while Yamashita was sweating his ass off at the table because he knew he was bluffing. And <laughs> Percival gave up one of the crown jewels of the British Empire. And uh, this is also at the same time as the disaster of 4C. So the Prince of Wales uh, had gone out legendarily out to sea to try and help uh, in some naval battles and like a hundred Japanese aircraft just destroy it. It was one of the first times that they had seen in the open ocean aircrafts take out a capital ship. And it was a huge humiliation for the British. Now, the Prince of Wales in particular, and again, you, you know this a heck of a lot better than I do. The Prince of Wales was to the Southeast Asian uh, Pacific Fleet uh, what the Hood was to the Atlantic Fleet. Great comparison, yeah. And uh, when the when the Bismarck took out the Hood, uh, talking talk about a way to really tick off the Royal Navy. I mean, yeah. um, at that point, the Royal Navy was all in to take out the Bismarck. Prince of Wales was kind of the same thing to Southeast Asia. Legendary, it had a legendary reputation too. So it, it was humiliating. Uh, the British were, I mean, it was a terrible, it was a catastrophe. And it was an ignorant catastrophe because even the men on the ship didn't think that aircraft could do anything to them. The, the knowledge of the capabilities of a torpedo bomber against a moving battleship, it wasn't really known, honestly. So right. they, they got taken out badly. And uh, just to go over the many other areas, it's it's almost hard to say everything. But Thailand was attacked at the offset as well. Thailand put up kind of a, a lackluster effort to defend themselves, but they were playing the fence on whether they were going to join the allies or the Japanese. They end up joining the Japanese quite quickly. Hmm. Uh, the Philippines is... If anyone wants to know more about that, you can go straight over to any of my episodes or even Kings and Generals. I am the one who wrote the disaster of the Philippines. So Douglas MacArthur had changed all of his war plans to have an initial first strike capability. So if the Japanese were ever to threaten them, which the Philippines was the number one target, they, America thought it, under no circumstances it not going to get hit first. So Douglas MacArthur had this large fleet of bombers that he was supposed to use to hit uh, what we know as Taiwan today. It was Formosa back then. And uh, he just doesn't. And there's a huge, really messed up reason as to why and has to do with his relationship with the president of the Philippines and all sorts of things. But uh, he blunders the defense of the Philippines and the Philippines falls into chaos very quickly. No, he must have had a much better PR firm that was working for him. It was than, his own. Uh, than, it was his own, right. He, he, was a, he was a man that kind of created his own will. But my point is like, you know, Kimmel, who was the commander at Pearl Harbor, yeah. I mean, he, he basically is forced to step down, right? Uh, MacArthur, on the other hand, he loses the Philippines. Uh, his men enter into that last ditch attack or last ditch defense at Corregidor, and then there is the Bataan Death March. Um, he says his famous words, I shall return. Yes. But yet he's not forced to like step down or do anything back like that. In fact, the guy is like essentially put into the spotlight and uh, he is uh, essentially the, the, the focus of what the United States is going to do later in the war. Too big to fail, I like to call him. <laughs> He's too big to fail. That's exactly right. So why do you think the United States propped him up so much? It was, oh God, we might take the whole podcast this one, but uh, <laughs> Douglas, 
because uh, as people who know my channel know me and my podcast uh, I have a notorious reputation for going into Douglas MacArthur I've read a lot of biographies on him uh, he had perpetuated himself to be a legendary figure his dad Did, come... didn't he refer to himself in the third person a lot uh, like yeah. in his own gosh you, you, when you start doing that man you, you the, the sense of megalomania is just he spoke um he spoke Shakespearean style he they they describe him as America's Caesar and it's so true the people who knew him like uh, you have quotes where people be like oh he didn't have a, a a staff he had a court and you know all sorts of stuff he had a full publicity team at, with him at all times who wrote everything about him to always make it seem better than it was they always basically lied on his behalf <laughs> the defense of the Philippines for example no one knew that it was honestly completely his fault he had blundered a pre a pre-planned defensive plan he had ruined it himself and then um when things weren't going well because he had planned to like defend on the beaches idiotically uh at the last minute he goes back to what is war plan orange three fails all the men like you say they end up running to Bataan with a third the supplies they were supposed to have because he never supplied it properly because he didn't have any intention to go through with that plan uh he escapes the Philippines by leaving his subordinate, <laughs> this poor unfortunate guy nicknamed Skinny, in charge, who was forced <laughs> to surrender on his behalf. Right, right. So therefore, he doesn't surrender. He doesn't lose face. Yeah. But, you know, it's a subordinate that did it. So, yeah, yeah, it's all but good, I guess. You take all the military stuff. You have to set it aside. FDR and MacArthur, think of them as candidates against each other for the presidency. Because yeah. Arthur, MacArthur was r running for the presidency multiple times, and during the war, he tried. He actually sent people sneakily over to the United States to see if the Republicans would vote for him. And it turns out, um, they, a lot of them would, except for the guys that had served under him. They all voted no. Because <laughs> they knew what he was like. <laughs> yeah, you know, here, in, and I'm glad I'm not the only one that feels this way. I always felt that he was a little pompous uh, there's a the, in here in san francisco there's a tunnel that you have to go through in order to go to the airport and uh you know whenever i go to the airport or pick somebody else up and every time i go through that uh tunnel i just always kind of sigh just a little bit because i always think about that but any case but so so, so that we can actually get to the two little red later i'll just say that uh macarthur he had this reputation and fdr couldn't afford to have him be captured he was the highest ranking military official out there and that's why he was pulled out of the philippines in the first place because of the fear if the japanese grabbed him they would have the number one hostage on their hands so by doing everything that they did it was it was kind of like a catch-22 fdr was forced to make this guy look like the fantastic general that could never lose because they had to spin everything to be a little bit more positive so when macarthur ends up in australia he spends the whole war just glorifying himself more and more and more taking more power diverting the whole war to his cause because he tries to go back to the philippines famously right and he just he made himself a rock star and he held fdr at gunpoint for the whole war yeah. which kind of dovetails into my into our next point which is uh, that after the attack on pearl harbor uh, there was a famous statement by uh, Yamamoto where he says that, you know, I can guarantee success for six months, which he was kind of right at that. And the amount of casualties that the Japanese sustained in this rapid expansion was was minuscule, e even compared to their standards. They, they think they were estimating like anywhere between 15 to 33 percent casualties, but they ended up with like less than one or two percent. Is is that about right? Yeah. And in the process of this expansion, Yamamoto's famous statement was that I, I fear that all we have done is awakened a slumbering giant. It actually wasn't him who said that, but um, a very oh, good movie, <laughs> a very good movie uh, popularized it. He said something, it's alleged that he said something to its effect, but there happens to be a, I can't remember the name of the other Japanese admiral. So another admiral had said something identical to it. So a lot of people think it's this other admiral, but in the Tora Tora Tora, very amazing movie they it's such a good quote that they put it in at the end and it's captured everybody's mind ever since that that's like it, it's quote. captured my mind like, like i said you know this better than i do <laughs> no but yamamoto has said so many things that are identical to it he's referred to america as being like the sleeping giant and stuff so that that's it, it fits exactly with as the movie said because the movie acknowledges that he doesn't say it in their i think in the end credits and they even say like this was the spirit of what he would have said if he had been asked at that time and uh okay. yeah the united i mean the, the japanese so they go supernova they defeat let's say uh hong kong they 
killed well, i'm a canadian they killed us canadians there they took over hong kong thailand the philippines guam and wake uh two other american held territories that go down with a fight mind you uh pretty brutal fight uh singapore falls the dutch east indies campaign is just kicking off just before the Doolittle raid uh the abdicom command which is a coalition of like australians the british the americans and the uh, the netherlands they're just getting wrecked i mean they have a naval force which is doing some damage to the japanese but it is minuscule tiny it's led by a pretty cool dutch admiral uh who does some nifty things with submarines but other than that they're losing everywhere they go they have no victories no nothing and the japanese are just on one string of victory after another so based on this awake King a slumbering giant is one thing, but giving it that firm resolve to fight is going to be a different thing. And FDR knew that the number one thing that he could lose is morale. American yeah. morale at this point is an all-time low. And, and why wouldn't it be? It, it looks ridiculous. Its uh, fleet has been destroyed. The uh, Japanese have overwhelmed the Pacific. It has given the, uh, the British uh, a black eye with the destruction of the Prince of Wales and the Repulse. Philippines have been taken and uh, MacArthur is now in Australia. So something needed to be done. Something had to be done. A, a, a flagging morale is probably the worst thing that could occur to the United States at this point. Right. So enter in the, the topic of our discussion, what, like 40 minutes into this? Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's why I was like, oh, look at the time. Yeah, we're going to have to definitely edit some, some of this stuff out. So on December 21st, 1941, FDR meets up with his top brass and he demands that retribution needs to be done. Yeah. And he's been he's been demanding this essentially since Pearl Harbor. Something yeah, the needs day to be after. done. Exactly. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And nobody actually has anything that they come up with. The, um, the, the, they wanted to launch an attack to bomb or do some sort of damage, and it can't be off to some you know, side portion of the Japanese empire. It has to be, it has to be directly at the heart of Japan. Yeah. If, you, if you're going to make a mark, that's the place to do it. Unfortunately, all of the islands that you were talking about are not anywhere close to what fighters can reach. Uh, same thing with the bombers. The closest thing that the Americans have at this point is going to be Midway. And, and even that is going to be out, out of the range of uh, bomber attack. So they did have three options that they talked about just to throw it out there. There mm -hmm. was the idea to launch from China, but the air defenses of the entire Japanese empire were directed in that direction. So they thought it was impossible. They could have done something with the USSR out of Vladivostok or on the peninsula, uh, but it didn't seem possible either because they couldn't get a good alliance going to do that. And the Japanese would uncover it beforehand. And the third and, and one the, was the, the Russians, just to, just to intercede, the Russians were apprehensive yes. to, to attack Japan because at this point, you have to think in the war, uh, December of 1941, uh, the Germans were just outside the gates of Moscow. Barbarossa. Yeah. And th there's that famous thing, which could or could not be actually true, where you, the, the Germans could actually see the, the light glinting off of uh, St. Basil's Cathedral in, in Red Square. Uh, whether that actually happened or not, it just kind of gives you an idea of just how far the Germans had advanced into Russia at that point. So the last thing that Russia wanted to do was open up another front with Japan at this point. So they're, they're going to be very apprehensive to uh, help the United States in any way, shape, and form on that, that area. Yeah. And the third one, which is the most unique one, because it's later talked about again, is the Aleutian Islands. The Americans acknowledged that it was theoretically possible to launch attacks against the, at least against Hokkaido, uh, from the Aleutians. But that one is disregarded quickly because the weather conditions were insurmountable. It, it was not a good area to lift off from. Correct. Correct. I almost kind of feel bad for the Japanese soldiers that took a couple of those islands later in the war. Like if you were stationed up there throughout the war, that, that would kind of that kind of suck a little bit. Yeah. Um, so enter into the scene, Francis S. Lowe. He was a submariner and he had been watching in Virginia uh, bombers taking off um, from an airfield. 
and there was an outline on the ground that was approximately 467 feet long, yeah. which was the distance of an aircraft carrier's flight deck. And he came up with the idea that perhaps if we're going to be attacking Japan, what we could do is try to figure out a way to launch a bomber off an aircraft carrier, which had never been done before. Certainly not. Uh, but I guess uh, desperation calls for desperate measures. And uh, this was reviewed by the upper brass. And then it was actually Bill Halsey um, that actually approved of it. Question was, who are they going to be putting in charge of what sounded like essentially a suicide mission? And the person that they found was Doolittle. Now, I actually have some information here about Doolittle, if you give me a second here. Mm -hmm. um, so James uh, Jimmy Doolittle, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, at this point, uh, was kind of a renaissance man. A lot of people think yeah. of him as just being a highly experienced uh, uh, naval aviator. Oh, I guess he wasn't a naval aviator, was he? He was more of a, he was in the army. Uh, so a lot of people just think of him as being just a very good aviator, but he was actually a, a very intelligent man. Uh, he had actually earned his master's and doctoral degree from um, MIT. Uh, he knew um, a lot of information about engineering. Uh, he understood uh, airplanes uh, backwards and forwards, specifically bombers. And when they asked him, they, they brought him forward and they asked him, you know, this is what we want to do. Uh, what do you think we should do? And his take on it, and immediately he came up to the same conclusion that everybody else had come up with. He said that the only thing that's going to work is a B-25. Uh, there were other um, bombers that they had in mind. Uh, I think the B-24 was a little um, too much of a hot rod, though it was very identical to a B-25. The B-26 Marauders uh, just had too long of an airframe yeah, wings. And, and wingspan. And um, they also, also considered a B-23 Dragon, yeah. but um, that uh, just nothing was feasible. A B-25... Uh, the B-25 uh, Mitchells were the ideal candidate for this type of thing. They could be stripped down to just bare bone minimum. And they had the wingspan to um, get off an aircraft carrier. Uh, if they had enough weight taken off of them, they could actually make the distance. And um, the only downside was that they would be able to launch from an aircraft carrier, but landing on an aircraft carrier would be impossible which kind of reminds me of that Indiana Jones quote, you know, he fly, when his dad asks him if he ever flown an airplane and he says, fly, yes, land, no. So it, it makes sense that they could take these uh, B-25s and launch them off the, uh, the flight decks. At which point, early in 1942, intense program, uh, an intense program begins where Doolittle gets people together and starts training his bomber crews to do specifically that. Nobody's actually told what they're going to be doing. Uh, but I think most of the men under his command could somewhat kind of figure this thing out. Oh, it would have been kind of a little bit obvious with what they were doing. Like you had said, they went out into a field and they put these flags to mark certain distances, like uh, 200, 300, 500 yards. And, you know, they were training these pilots to take off uh, in an extreme way. So for example, uh, a lot of these pilots were taught how to, you know, just like when you have a car, put on the brakes, but kick the engine up, get the engine hot and running, and then like jackrabbit to accelerate as fast as you can at the offset so that you can take off from a shorter and shorter distance. And then everything on that bomber was basically stripped down to just about nothing. Uh, yeah. the, the bomb sites were modified. Uh, some of the machine guns were uh, either either taken off or, or modified as well. And so the weight was going to be the biggest issue. The uh, B-25 can usually carry uh, a bomb load of... Uh, it will be configured to carry a one-ton bomb payload. So the B-25 uh, Mitchell had a range of about 1,300 miles. It carried a crew of five. It usually can carry up to a bomb load of 5,000 pounds. And its wingspan of 67 feet, 7 inches allowed it to launch off the aircraft carrier. Yeah. But it was modified to only carry about 2,000 pounds. 
So one ton of bombs in order to make this thing happen. And again, the idea behind this was not so much to inflict so much damage, but to affect the fact that Americans could fight back. So the way that it worked out was that on April 2nd, after all of these uh, trials are done, um, the B-25s are brought to Alameda here in San Francisco, and they're loaded on board the USS Hornet. Task Force 18 was the designation for it, and it sailed out of San Francisco Bay on April 2nd, making its way west. On April 13th, Task Force 16, under the command of Halsey with the uh, USS Enterprise, uh, which I believe was his flagship, yep. uh, meets up with uh, Task Force 18 at Midway, and the two ships combine together. Now, th this, is, this is an extreme risk for several different reasons. At this point, not only are they sailing into Japanese-held water, but the fact that they are essentially just an isolated task force with only two carriers. And of those two carriers, the Hornet has B-25s on its flight deck, which precludes its ability to launch its own fighters. So it's, it's kind of a sitting duck. The Enterprise is going to have to do most of the work at this point. Yeah, so in uh, carrier terms, you say you're running cap. So that's a, a fighter right. squadron over your ship just to run a screen as to anything that's coming against you. But Enterprise has to run cap for itself and the Hornet during this operation. They do have escorting uh, vessels, of course, but we're talking about mere peanuts compared to anything the Japanese could throw at them. Exactly, exactly. And if that task force was spotted and uh, the Japanese were able to retaliate in force, that, that would be a very difficult thing for it to, um, to get out of, uh, especially where they're going to be sailing past Midway. They're really heading into, um, into enemy waters. Yes, and they do get spotted. So on April 18th, at approximately 7.38 a.m., they bump up with a Japanese ship. This thing is so tiny, it doesn't even show up on the radar. It is the uh, Nito Maru, and um, it's, a, it's a tiny craft um, which uh, immediately notifies uh, the rest of the Japanese high command that they have spotted incoming aircraft carriers, and so their cover is blown. Now, the initial plan was to get within 400 miles of the Japanese mainland and launch the, uh, the bombers at that point in time, but they are probably about 650 miles out at this point, so 150 miles beyond where they need to be. And the American task force responds almost immediately to this ship. The, the USS Nashville, which is a light carrier, uh, a Brooklyn-class light carrier, is sent out and immediately unleashes. And, and you almost have to feel sorry for the people on board this, this, this ship. Extremely embarrassing, yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, think about it this way, like you have basically a small ship that some people even attribute to being almost like a fishing vessel. Yeah, it was about a 70 ton. It has steel hull, but it, it, it's a what you would call a picket boat. So it probably was a fishing ship once upon a time. And yeah. <laughs> and the amount of, of um, so the task force unleashes, there, there's a video footage of the Nashville and some support vessels um, just wrecking havoc and i always wonder if somebody would like actually sit down and calculate how many bullets were actually or how many shells were actually thrown at this thing. oh i have the number oh you have? <laughs> okay tell me oh yes because it's actually it's a huge uh halsey would go on the record as saying it was one of the most embarrassing things he ever seen so the um the nashville couldn't hit it it would fire 928 six inch shells. <laughs> oh my God. Wildcats were from the cap came in and one, I don't know if it was a combined thing, like 20,000 rounds were fired, like a full magazine clip from one of their planes to take this thing down. It was and so embarrassing. The little ship fired back and they couldn't even shoot to like the half point. They, they could basically make half the range towards the Nashville. So they yeah, were just- but it, was a, yeah. it was a symbolic shot. Yeah. Not, not, not so much across the bow, but you know, at least into the water. But uh, what's crucial to the story is they did have radio equipment. It was a picket ship. Its whole purpose was to say if anything was coming in, they report back to uh, Tokyo. Well, it actually gets picked up by the great super battleship Yamato that three American carriers are about to attack the home islands. 
which is absurd. And a lot of people thought it was absurd in Japan when they heard this radio signal. Yeah, how can something possibly be attacking us? And, and that kind of goes into the mindset of, of the Japanese in the mainland. They, they did not think they could be touched. Nope. In any case, the USS Nashville finally destroys this thing. And if you look at this from a cost basis point of view, the amount of shells that were expended, I think the Japanese probably won this round. <laughs> In any case, the, the ship goes to the bottom. They managed to capture some, um, uh, some, um, some people in the process of doing this. And then the task force turns around. And as they're making their way back, uh, they encounter two other vessels. So the task force's uh, is position is completely blown. Yeah. Um, the Nashville will go into action again and actually sink another ship in the process. But going back to the time when this, this fleet was picked up, the decision was made that they needed to launch the bombers. This was going to be their opportunity. If they don't do it now, then they're not going to have a chance. At approximately 8.20 a.m. on April 18th, 1942, the fleet turns into the wind and the Hornet starts launching the B-25s. Doolittle is in the uh, leading bomber and it's, 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 a compl it's a very difficult situation to launch in. First, they're, they're not sure if they're going to make it. Second, the wind conditions and weather conditions at the time were very adverse. And so not only does, not only does he have to fly this B-25, into the wind off a very short distance, but he also has to time it so that the bow of the ship is going to be high in the, in the water. Miraculously, he's able to make it off, and he's followed by the other 16 or the other 15 B 25 Mitchells. They all manage to make it up in the air. And at that point, Doolittle Raid has begun. Four hours later, they spot uh, the mainland of. Uh, Japan. Now, again, each one of these bombers is carrying a 2,000 pound bomb load. And a lot of people think that it was just Tokyo that was going to be the main target. But as it turns out, there were several other targets. Let me see if I can find my page here. So, Tokyo was not only the main target, but there were also several others Nagoya, Kobe, and Osaka were a couple of others. And as they approach the mainland of uh, Japan, they start fanning out in order to attack several different targets. Most of the bombers go after Tokyo. Several go after Nagoya and a couple go after Osaka. I, I believe it was just one bomber that actually went after Kobe. Let's see. Yeah, and they, they're flying in... Uh groups of three bombers each there's basically five waves of them and they are flying dangerously low to the sea level at the beginning and then low to the ground because they've been fed inside information from a man named jerika who uh, was a attache to tokyo for a long time before the war and he basically told them everything he knew about the outlook of japan and where the anti-aircraft uh, defenses would be and how they operated and uh, it was critical information and actually served them very well and to Doolittle's credit, he had been training his crews to fly the bombers as if they were fighters, low yep. to the ground, making erratic maneuvering. And this served that, that formation extremely well because the anti-aircraft guns were not trained to hit bombers that low. And not uh, only were... that, they, to, be, to be blunt, it's ironic to say, but the same element of surprise that was found at Pearl Harbor, where initially a lot of the military staff on some of these ships saw some Japanese planes showing up, and they're like, oh, that's, that's clearly some of our planes. Over in Japan, in Tokyo, multiple, many people saw these planes, and they just looked at them, and they saw the emblem, which kind of resembled an older emblem of the Japanese of once upon a time, although it had the star on it. They were confused by this. And they were like, oh, those are Japanese aircraft, I guess. Yeah, let them through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the anti-aircraft guns are able to inflict either no damage or minimal damage. Uh, there's actually Japanese fighters that, that engage the bombers, but mm -hmm. even then, they're not able to take any of these things down. I do have one, then, one small story because I think this will blow people's mind. One of the bombers that was, I think, in the same formation with Doolittle himself went over Tokyo Bay and at like fate at the exact same time 
this is allegedly this is this close an aircraft uh is bringing hideki tojo somewhere because he's going to a meeting and he alleged uh, someone on his staff says he noticed one of these bombers that was coming in, they flew so close that he remarked, is that a Caucasian guy flying that aircraft? No, oh, no way. I, and it's one of those things that where I have a hard time believing be it. But yeah, <laughs> apparently. Well, in either, either case, if you've got Tojo flying in Tokyo Bay, then that's going to make the uh, Japanese uh, fighter pilots even more apprehensive to shoot anything down. Yeah, because there was fighters, like you said, everywhere. And initially, they weren't firing back. They just watched these planes go by. No one knew any better at the beginning. And then the bomb bay doors open up and the bombs are unleashed. Now, I, I heard that one of the things that Doolittle did was he attached the peace medals that the Japanese gave the American government yeah. to the bombs themselves uh, before he, he dropped them out of the uh, bomb bay door. I think that's just a, just a, a lovely little touch, you know, that's... Um, and I, I wonder, I, they probably didn't find any of those medals afterwards, but and if they did, I think that would be the... Uh, That'd be the ultimate FU. That would definitely. Um, so the bombs are unleashed, and the damage that it does is fairly minimal. Uh, the bombers don't hit anything that has a civilian kind of uh, vibe to it. They definitely want to stay away from like the Imperial Palace, that kind of thing. Strict orders uh, not to. Hit. They fly directly over it on purpose, but they had direct orders not to bomb the Imperial Palace. Yes, and that that's much more of a psychological type of thing. I mean, I, I think having a bomber fly over the Imperial Palace and not do anything is is probably the perfect response. Uh, if it did bomb the uh, Imperial Palace, I think that would have um, kind of bolstered morale more than anything. It, yeah, it would have really fired them up. And uh, Emperor Hirohito had to be escorted uh, to a bomb shelter because of this. And that's the ultimate, ultimate... Um, that is the ultimate humiliation. It's a loss of face for both the Imperial Army and the Imperial Navy. Correct. The bombs themselves don't do that much damage as far as from a military standpoint. In fact, the, the damage that's been done is fairly negligible. They do hit some military targets in the other areas in Nagoya and in Kobe. Uh, but for the most part, this is stuff that the Japanese can rebuild very quickly. They did hit, uh, one, there is an odd small story. There was a light carrier that was being designed. Uh, it was actually from the hull of a old battleship that got reconfigured. It was the Riho. And uh, it gets hit by a single bomb and it delays it for six months, which is in parallel to what happened to ships at Pearl Harbor. So, Right. Yes. So after that, the, uh, the bombers have done what they needed to do. Now the real uh, testament is to figure out what to do uh, beyond that. Uh, they have to make it back to China. Again, they, they launched prematurely uh, because they were because the task force was discovered. Yes. And not all of them are going to make it. So altogether, there were 16 bombers. Three of them, I've been told, have been ditched into the, uh, into the sea, the South China Sea. And then to make things even more difficult, as the bombers are making their way from Japan, they go right into a storm. So yeah. they have to gain altitude. They have to kind of visibility is almost down to nothing. They, they have to fly just basically on, on control. So this, this doesn't bode well for them. One of the bombers has to veer off. Uh, there was an issue with its carburetor, which allowed it to, uh, which basically made it use up more fuel than anticipated. And it has to land in Vladivostok. And my understanding is that the, the Russians uh, did not want to break any treaty violations, so the crew was uh, taken as prisoners of war. But they were treated really well, and I'm sure they were given a lot of like vodka or something. Oh, he had a great time. Then, yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah. He, the, the Russians showed him a really good time, and then uh, then afterwards they they staged their escape. You know, like, oh no, please don't don't run away. Exactly, no, don't yes. don't go through that door. No, what? And they run like directly out of uh, a Russian prison right to the British consulate, and then they're you know, <laughs> they're yeah. safe. Uh, the, the remaining bombers. Uh, so there were 80 airmen altogether, um, of which most of these landed, crash landed in, um, in, in China. Doolittle himself, kind of in this heroic um, stance, tells his men to, um, to bail out, sets the bomber on autopilot, and then bails out himself. He's the last man off the plane. 
which I, I think that that's kind of just a nice touch. It, it ties into his, his, his somewhat, his, 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 uh, his heroic character, so to speak. And then most of the bombers crash land. Of the 80 airmen, uh, it's 64 eventually end up making it. And, and again, the, the numbers are a little skewed here. Um, some places I've read it was 64 that actually make it. Others say 61. Can you comment on that? Uh, so of men who evade the capture and the death laters, it's 69, I believe. But uh, five men are captured in uh, in Jiangxi province. So a, a lot of these uh, pilots, they're landing in Zhejiang in Jiangxi province of China. If, you, if your audience knows the map of China, which I know myself is quite difficult to gauge. But uh, these are hidden airfields. And unfortunately, um, Claire uh, Chenault, who was overseeing kind of that side of the operation, he wasn't told anything about anything that was going on. So he couldn't warn all the Chinese crews to light lights on these airfields so it made matters worse for these pilots they actually didn't know where they were flying to but uh five of these guys end up getting captured by the japanese uh immediately it's like the the same night of the day that they land and uh three of the men die at the offset so uh like you said the ones that crashed in the ocean there were guys who had sur survived by swimming ashore but they got really lucky but there were some others that drowned so three guys died at the offset right Oh, and sorry. Eight the, guys get captured. Excuse me. That's true. Eight, eight get captured. And and even the ones that were that drowned in the ocean, my understanding is that they were their bodies were actually recovered after the war, oh. and they were brought back here uh, to San Francisco, and they're they're buried, they're interred in the uh, Golden Gate Cemetery. That. Oh wow! Uh, so um, yeah, I, I I probably should see if I can find where they're located. In any case. Um, so, of the men that, that, that land, uh, a couple of them are executed by the Japanese. Most of them actually make it back. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to make a point of this, uh, eight men are captured. Um, the, most of the Japanese leadership in the IJ wants to kill them all immediately. Uh, they didn't even want to have a trial. A trial was forced. It's a mock trial, mind you. They're transported over to uh, Tokyo for this. Hideki Tojo is scared about killing them all he thinks there'll be repercussions to this uh diplomatically so he goes to emperor hirohito to talk about the matter and they agree that the emperor will allow five men to survive so uh three are executed out of the eight the other five men will go off will live throughout the entire war except for one who does succumb to uh, berry berry disease and dysentery right all of them almost die from starvation unbelievable Terrible conditions. It was really bad for them. Yeah. Of the men that actually made it out of uh, Japanese incarceration, some of them actually lived well past the year 2000. Yes. Actually, the Doolittle, I, I can't speak of this too much because I, I don't know the story, but I know that the Doolittle pilots had a reunion like every year. And oh, the we'll, last... we'll get to that. We'll get to okay. that. We'll, we'll get to that. We'll talk about that. that. You're going you're gonna to steal my fire here. Okay, um, I'll leave that one to you. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, so here's the thing. Uh, the Japanese actually have to make an announcement. They broadcast that their homeland has been attacked. Oh, yeah. And ironically, it's the Japanese broadcast that gives Halsey the information that his raid has actually been successful. Yes. Now, the Chinese population that that harbored these men, they are, uh, the reprisal against them is extremely vicious. Yeah, if we do have a little bit of time, I'd like to go into details about that because it's very this is, an, this is an overlooked thing in history. Yeah. It, it, they, they glamorize the raid. They talk about how great Doolittle yeah. was, but they don't talk about this. I think it's really important that you talk about this. So... What ended up happening is they interrogated the eight guys immediately from the offset by torturing them on the 18th. Uh, it starts on the 19th. They get a bit more information out of them, but the Americans are actually feeding them uh, bullshit. So they're telling them that a mystical supercarrier has transported these B-25s or some of them say, hey, we came from the Aleutians. Ironically, the Japanese believed a lot of them theorized that these were coming from the Aleutians possibly from a supercarrier they thought that was plausible from a secret base in the philippines and there was even some insane guy who thought there was a secret base in japan that was a weird wow. one 
But uh, they torture these officers and they eventually find out exactly what had happened, that it was the U.S.'s Hornets, these are B-25s, how they did it and everything. The Japanese Imperial Army then is thinking, okay, so they landed into China, they landed predominantly in Zhejiang and Jiangxi province. Obviously, the Chinese are helping them. They find out because they're going through villages, okay, the Chinese, some missionaries, a lot of missionaries from like United States, Canada, and Britain were helping out these pilots. It's an incredible effort to get all these Americans food, supplies, and everything they need to get to Chongqing and then to get out. What the Japanese decide to do is absolutely horrifying. It is known as Operation Sego. If you look it up on Wikipedia or something, it would come up as uh, the Zhejiang Jiangxi campaign. They release 53 battalions with the mission. They have two oper they have two missions. So the primary mission is to neutralize all these secret air bases and forward air bases that are in the Zhejiang Jiangxi provinces. They succeed easily. They it's one of the worst assaults uh, that they perform upon the Chinese Nationalist Army, but as well as the civilians. But this is one of the first times a other unit is going in the background behind the army, and this is Unit 731, the biological warfare unit that is operating out of Manchuria. They unleash bubonic plague, anthrax, chloria bombs, every biological weapon that they have at their disposal. They poison wells. They poison and contaminate food. They contaminate candy to give to children. Even their own officers, a thousand out of like 17,000 Japanese die as a result of this, from the contamination of biological weapons. This leads to the estimation, Chiang Kai-shek said later on, like something like 250,000 people died as a result of this extermination. It's a horrible, horrible part of the uh, Second Sino-Japanese War. And um, Chiang Kai-shek would go on the record, he cables FDR, and he, I have the quote right here of what he says to him. Japanese troops slaughtered every man, woman, and child in those areas. Let me repeat. These Japanese troops slaughtered every man, woman, child in those areas. He's referring to the two provinces. And the Japanese, the, the, there is no mercy. It's the same thing you would hear in the rape in Nanking. Rapes, plundering, the murder. A lot of missionaries, uh, there was a famous Canadian missionary, fully witnessed villages just raised to the ground and everyone killed. And it was in retaliation for them aiding the Americans during the Doolittle Raid. It's just incredible to hear that. It's, um, it's sobering. Uh, the Japanese were that violent in, in their reprisal to this action. I mean, it's from one perspective, you can say that, you know, that it was their homeland that was attacked and their loss of face, but that kind of reprisal it seems extreme by any measure. When it comes to World War II, it's a, I like to always parallel that when the Germans were fighting uh, the Allies in the Western Front when they came after D-Day, they were fighting with white gloves on. The Eastern Front against the Soviets, it was unparalleled, disgusting violence with the Einsatzgruppen and stuff going around. For the Japanese, right. when the Japanese were operating against the Chinese, there was it was a race war it they they were subhumans to them they did untold horrors and unit 731 is a particularly nasty nasty group that was involved in this they're basically one of the first biological warfare groups ever created incredible incredible i am really glad that you brought that up i mean like i said this is something that's almost completely glossed over uh, and it's it's kind of an unfortunate thing that that is not acknowledged more in the history books in uh, probably should figure out a way to get <laughs> to the next topic <laughs> um so in the aftermath of that raid Doolittle um makes it back and Initially, his first thing was that he thought he was going to be court-martialed. Instead, he wins the uh, he, he's uh, awarded the uh, the Medal of Honor. In the aftermath of the Little Raid, America was invigorated after its long string of defeats, uh, loss at Pearl Harbor, the loss of the Philippines, the fact that it was losing on other fronts in the Pacific, and the British had also taken a black eye. 
this invigorated morale as never before. It actually came at a perfect time because this is right when the Bataan Death March and everything is kicking off and the fall of Singapore. So it kind of came arguably one of the best times it could to raise morale. Correct. Uh, the fighting spirit was invigorated and you would see that in what would happen subsequently after this. Uh, you would have the Battle of the Coral Sea, uh, the first time when you had two major forces that are confronting each other where actual surface ships don't actually come into contact with each other. And then after that, just a few months after this raid in June of 1942, you have the Battle of Midway. Uh, and I, I would like to make this point because uh, the most important aspect of the Doolittle Raid is it forced Midway. In the aftermath of the raid, the Japanese had to rethink their strategy. Mm -hmm. If they could be attacked in their homeland, then all of this offensive capability might need to be toned down just a little bit, and forces need to be redeployed in much more of a defensive posture. Uh, the coastline of, uh, of China was reinforced to prevent bombers from landing there, and a lot of the Japanese mentality was now geared towards protecting the home islands a little bit more. Towards this end, one of the things that the Japanese high command came up with was that it needed to neutralize the American carriers. Why don't you go ahead and talk about um, um, how it forced Midway. So the Doolittle raid happened coincidentally at the exact same time Yamoto was arguing for a new operation. So when Pearl Harbor was something that he was planning, everybody in the naval general staff and apparently and basically 100% of the army were against him they thought pearl harbor was a stupid operation the battle of toronto kind of showed them oh there could be some success here and then yamoto got his way yamoto had been pitching the midway operation from the very offset of this war he was always transfixed with a decisive naval battle because that's the japanese doctrine of the navy it was you win a decisive battle you knock him out and then that's you're going to win the war Everyone was against him, including all of his colleagues. They thought it was stupid. Right when the Doolittle Raid happened and they got hit, Yamamoto, he literally was sick to his stomach. He locked himself in his room. Admiral Ugaki had to take charge and he ordered every available vessel to go attack uh, the USS Hornet and the Enterprise to try and catch him before they could escape. Nagumo himself was coming back from the Indian Ocean with the Kido Butai and he was tossed on a wild goose chase. It was embarrassing. The Japanese Navy had lost face. The emperor could have been killed. It was a disaster. Like you said, they had to uh, bring back four army air squadrons to be maintained within uh, the Japanese home islands from 1942 to 1943. That would be necessary for operations in the South Pacific. It actually would hurt their New Guinea campaign. So the Doolittle Raid, um, you could argue, dampered the attack on Port Moresby, something I would argue. And it led to the Coral Sea battle as well. But for Yamoto, he told everyone the day after the raid, when he finally came out of his room, you know what? These Americans had to have come from Midway. No one believed him. Uh, it was easily found out that these planes could not have come from Midway. It was too far away. But he then kept pressing the point, oh, it was carriers that did this to us. We cannot allow American carriers to be operating so close to the home islands. They could destroy everything. So the American carriers were an obsession. Yamamoto basically drove it home. We have to destroy the American carriers because look what they can do. They can attack Tokyo. Uh, it worked. The Naval General Staff went along with this. Even a, for a few members of the Imperial Army said yes, on a condition that they would invade the Aleutian Islands because they did think that the Aleutian Islands could also be used against them in the same manner. And the dumbest thing that they thought of was, oh, we'll go along with this mission if we can land forces on uh, Midway, Atoll, which if they had won the Battle of Midway, every single man who would have landed on Midway would have been shot down. Like it was so unbelievably stupid. Anyways, so he got his operation approved. And it was a catastrophe. Midway was a jaw-dropping blunder that really ruined things for Yamamoto and his reputation, ruined things for the entire Navy. Uh, they were not defeated. People like to call it the turning point of the war. 
technically it was a turning point, not the turning point. That would be Guadalcanal. But Doolittle and his raid is exactly what caused Midway to occur at the time it occurred and the way it occurred. So one could argue for such a small event, it led to the victory for America in the end. It, it had major repercussions for the rest of the war. Yeah. After, after uh, Midway and uh, after Guadalcanal, it was basically the Americans trying to just roll up the carpet. The initiative was won after Guadalcanal. What they like to, a lot of people like to tell you is that the Battle of Midway was a turning point in the sense that it was the, the first victory where the Japanese had actually lost considerable amount of forces. They still had the initiative, so they weren't on the defensive yet, but it allowed the Americans to be pretty bold. They got very bold when they landed troops in Guadalcanal. They shouldn't have. If you look at it from a numerical point of view, it was suicide. But winning at Guadalcanal won America the initiative, and they controlled how the war would go from that point on. But uh, like dominoes, Doolittle started it all. Exactly. And and again, it all comes down to the fact that morale was restored, and yeah. at that point, America was definitively in the war to win it. So going back to Doolittle, after this raid, the man thought he was going to be court-martialed. He he's, he surmised that he had lost all these bombers. You know, what's uh, the American government going to do to me? Initially, his thought was that he was going to be court-martialed. Instead, he was brought back, and he won the Medal of Honor. Many men in his uh, his um, raiding group were also decorated heavily for this. And later, after the war, in 1959, Tucson, Arizona, awarded 80 silver goblets for the initial 80 airmen who had been part of this raid. Every year after that, they would meet and they would sip Hennessy cognac from these silver goblets. As an airman would die, the goblet was turned upside down. In 2019, we're talking just a few years ago, the last man of the Doolittle raid, uh, the co-pilot of, um, of Doolittle himself, a man by the name of Dick Cole, died at the age of 103. He was the last surviving member of the Doolittle raid. That case uh, with the 80 silver goblets now all turned upside down is now uh, housed at the National Museum of the United States Air Force. Incredible. 103. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an incredible story. And I always find that most fail to see the greater significance of such a small event. Many say, yes, it was the morale booster that gave, you know, that oomph to, to America. And they finally gave a black eye to Japan. But like I said, operationally, it actually caused a catastrophe for the Japanese because the the changes that they made, uh, everything that Yamamoto went through to force his midway operation, which saw corrections, the army added on the Aleutians and the idea to invade the atoll of midway itself, and it ruined the operation. Um, they should have never gone through with it. Um, Doolittle did more than he would ever know at the time. Exactly, exactly. Well, Craig, you, your knowledge on this is is just absolutely incredible. Uh, anybody listening at home, please check out his channel. His uh, his content is is really really good. Uh, not only is he uh, doing his own channel, but he's also a writer for Kings and Generals, which I think pretty much everybody has heard of. Uh, who's into history, and um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. You you want to yeah? Why don't you do just like a quick shout out for yourself too? Oh sure. So uh, like you uh, had said, I do write for Kings and Generals, and uh, I, I'm the narrator and host of two other podcasts. So there's the Pacific War Week by Week and the Age of Conquest, the Fall and Rise of China podcast. Uh, myself, I have the uh, the Pacific War Channel over on YouTube, and I, I have uh, podcast episodes. It's a chronological series going from 1830s all the way up to the end of the Pacific War. And I even do, you know, funny tier lists and silly videos. So yeah, if you uh, like the Pacific War and other things about Asia, come check me out. Well, again, Craig, thank you for uh, being on the show. And um, I'm looking forward to making this thing into um, a nice video for everybody for uh, them to watch. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me.